In this section, we will state and prove Dixon's lemma. So Dixon's lemma says that a monomial ideal has a finite basis. Of course, if you know about uh, Hilbert's basis theorem, this is an immediate corollary, but the proof of Dixon's lemma is elementary. And moreover, you can deduce Hilbert's basis theorem from Dixon's lemma, something we will do in the later um, lectures. So it's worth uh, giving its proof. So I take any monomial ideal IA, and uh, Dixon's lemma says that there's a finite subset of A, essentially a finite subset of your generators, which generates IA. So let me write down the remark that it follows from Hilbert's basis theorem. Now remember, Hilbert's basis theorem says that any ideal in a polynomial ring has a finite basis. Of course, then this is a very special case since we're dealing with monomial ideals. But you'll see that the proof is elementary, and in the end, using Grubner basis, something we'll do later, uh, Hilbert's basis theorem becomes a simple corollary. Before we start the proof, let's also make a definition that follows from Dixon's lemma. So we will call a basis of a monomial ideal uh, a minimal basis if none of the monomials in your basis divide one another. And it's a simple exercise to show that every monomial Every monomial ideal admits a minimal basis, and a minimal basis is unique. And if you can think back to the picture we drew in the previous lecture, in fact, let's just go up to it. Here it is. We're simply saying that the corners generate the ideal, and these corners form a minimal basis. And this was a two-dimensional picture, so the, there are corners also in higher dimensions, and they are your minimal basis. Well, now it's worth sketching the proof of Dixon's lemma because it's uh, elementary and uh, there's a nice combinatorial flavor to it. But uh, let's go up and discuss what we need to prove, really. So the statement said that, first of all, we have a finite basis and I can choose my finite basis from the set of generators that you've given me. And so I, I think we should rule this out uh, from the beginning that I'm really looking at the corners of this shape that I described previously. So I will have a higher dimensional pictures with many corners like this. Now, obviously, the corners are unique, and any corner will necessarily have to be inside the set of generators that you've given me. Again, and this is a simple consequence of this uh, description as a union. So I can always get, given a point, I can only get things to its right and up and whatever, so I can only get items to, to its positive directions away from it, and corners will be in a negative direction for uh, the every point in a shaded region. Okay, so the fact that I can find a subset as a basis uh, is settled. I just need to show finiteness. And although it's clear in the two-dimensional picture, uh, because we can't draw these higher dimensional pictures so clearly in our head, maybe it requires a moment of thought. Let's try to formalize our intuition in two dimensions, and then we'll talk about how it extends to three dimensions, and then the rest is clear. Okay, so maybe someone has given me a monomial ideal uh, whose exponent vectors give me this shaded region. And what I want to say is uh, that there are finitely many corners. So the corners will be a generating set. In fact, it will be the minimal basis. Of course, looking at this picture, there are finitely many corners, but uh, let's make this uh, formal. So what I want to do is uh, to following. Since each corner has to lie on an point with integer coordinates, if I were to bound this region, so if I were to say that there's a finite region containing all corners, then I'm done. So in a bounded region, there are only finitely many points with integer coordinates, and some subset of it will be actually my corners, and then I'm done with proving finiteness. So the goal is to find, uh, find this bounded region. And I'm saying, well, I can, in fact, just give you a single point and say the box defined by this single point uh, contains all my corners. So now I've reduced my goal to finding this single point with uh, this good property of 
bounding a box containing all corners. Now let's make this a little bit more precise. I can already see this optimal point. If I were to go to this uh, point, essentially to the far left here, and then continue drawing this line and then go down to this point, I get uh, the point that, at least in this picture, has a desired property. And now the point is to make uh, the construction of this point more formal so that I don't use this picture explicitly. And here's the idea. I say that I take my shaded region and I project it onto, let's say, the leftmost axis. And I see here that my projection will give me everything to the top of this line. So I'm just going to mark the lowest point. So uh, in any case, I know that this gives me an integer. Let's maybe call it b1. This b1 can be 0, for example, if uh, this blue line here was on the lower axis, then this b1 will be 0. Anyway, so then I, I simply go to the corresponding point uh, on my shaded region. There has to be a corresponding point, And then I read its coordinate. Let's, let's say it has coordinates a1 and b1. I repeat it now for the uh, lower axis. I do a projection. This time, project the shaded region onto this axis. Now I see that I recover everything to the left of this point. Let's call this point A2. So that's the coordinate of the, some point. And this point, so there has, there has to be a point, the first point corresponding to this A2 coordinate will have coordinates A2, B2. And my star will have to be the maximum of all coordinates here. So that is now let's discuss why this has to be the optimal point in general. Uh, I know that whenever I recover this point A1, B1, uh, I can put this quadrant based at this point. I know that there will be no other point uh, that has smaller coordinates in the y direction, so that uh, I've recovered the lowest facet of my highlighted uh, blue region. And uh, similarly, for the leftmost corner here, by design, I will have the quadrant placed at this point. I will have nothing to the left of this quadrant in my shaded region. And I've already recovered then uh, the shaded region here. So these two points already give me the shaded region. And then that's enough uh, because now every other corner that's going to contribute to cre the creation of new monomials inside my ideal uh, has to be to the left and bottom of this box that I just formed by adding these shaded regions. The pictures become harder to draw in higher dimensions, but uh, we will do use induction. And I think the picture becomes immediately clear when we do n equals 3, so the three-dimensional picture. Now it's much harder for me to draw a picture here, but uh, we will do the following. First of all, observe that whenever I have a point in 3 space, so maybe it has coordinates here, so if this is my point, then the quadrant, the translation of N3 will look like this. And I will have this shaded box now, this infinite shaded box. So my goal is the same without drawing a caricature blue region here. What I want to do is to create one point that is supposed to bound all of my corners. So there's probably a point here somewhere where all the interesting corners should lie within the box bounded by this red point and the origin. And I would like to find this uh, red point. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to project a shaded region someone else has given me onto one of the coordinate axes. Let's say I project onto I3. So then there will be, so necessarily the projection will be a bunch of integers on I3 and there will be a smallest integer. Let's call this maybe C1. Now, based at this C1, I can draw a plane and consider the intersection of this plane with uh, the blue shaded region, three-dimensional blue shaded region someone else has given me. Now it's uh, this intersection I can draw. It should look like something like this. And I've found the lower facet of this uh, blue region. Moreover, I can do uh, this inductive argument from before. You see that this shaded region has the same properties uh, for an monomial ideal for the region that you'd get for a monomial ideal, namely that if I have a point here, I'd get the entire quadrant. So it will look like a staircase once again. 
And since uh, this is just the two-dimensional picture which we have dealt with before, I know that there exists a point, so it looks about here, that captures all of the corners of my staircase. So the box bounded by this green point and this orange point will capture all the corners of my lower facet. So let's call this point A1, B1, C1. And now here's the idea. You should repeat this for all of the three axes. And then I claim that the red point that we are after that's going to bound all our corners is going to be the uh, maximum of these coordinates. So maybe it will be lying right above this. And the, the proof that this uh, star should satisfy our desired property is very clear. That I once again take the, for example, going to this orange point, I take the coordinate here, and then I go to the coordinate here, and I place my 3D quadrants at these two points. And they block uh, almost everything that uh, would be necessary, except this block would be stretching out to infinity so that I cannot block this uh, third dimension. But anyway, once I repeat it for the other axes, I'm going to get two more blocks for each uh, axis, and then they will finally block out a finite uh, region. What this means is that the quadrants that I've placed already tell me what monomials I can get just from these vertices alone, and then any other vertex that I need to add, and they will produce no new monomials, uh, will have to be contained in the unshaded region, and that's precisely described by this red point. Now, to finish off the proof, we say that do induction for general n. And I leave this as an exercise. So the mechanics of the proof is exactly clear. You know how to do it now. You just project onto all the axes. You just have to convince yourself once again that the uh, point you'll get in the end that uh, bounds a box will contain all the corners. And there are finitely many corners in this finite region because there are finitely many uh, lattice points. This concludes our discussion of Dixon's lemma. And now we're going to see how Dixon's lemma can be used to create a Grubner basis. And from this, we will be able to complete and uh, perfect our division algorithm.